Welcome, everyone. This is absolutely fantastic. I'm so excited. And all of us are at Lighthouse are super, super excited to see you here tonight. Um, know there's people coming from you know quite quite far afield and lots of people from the Edinburgh communities, and it's just absolutely wonderful. I hope that you had a chance to chat to people at their tables at the back as you were coming in. Uh, we had folks from Climate Camp Scotland, from Stop Rosebank, um, hopefully people from Edinburgh Anti-Raids as well, and a few other folks. So if you haven't had a chance to speak to them, um, make sure you do before you leave and maybe grab a flyer, put down your email address. I know that it can be really difficult to know where to start in terms of organizing and that it can be really daunting, but all it really takes is just that one step um, to, to step into a room with other people and there will be a place for you. There will be something that you can contribute with, with your skills and the person that you are. Uh, and this will definitely be a part of the conversation tonight, I think. Um, I should say, I'm, my name is Jess, uh, I'm an author and climate justice organizer and I work as digital campaigns manager for Lighthouse. We are here tonight to celebrate a wonderful, wonderful book and a wonderful human uh, who I know has worked alongside many of you here in Edinburgh and further afield and also inspired others from, from afar. Um, you know who Michaela is, <laughs> so it's, but still, I feel like at a launch, it's very important to, you know, give a bit of a backstory and to really celebrate the human that has written this book. So, Michaela Loach is a climate justice activist, co-host of the Yikes podcast, writer and fourth year medical student based in Surrey. I should say that today, uh, Michaela graduated, so to... <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> You know, to graduate and to have your book launch in one day, that is like, that's, that's pretty cool. That is amazing. In 2021, Michaela was one of three claimants on the paid to pollute case who took the UK government to court over the huge public payments they give to fossil fuel companies every year. And this is something that you can read more about in It's Not That Radical. Her work focuses on the intersections of the climate crisis with oppressive systems and making the climate movement a more accessible space. A huge round of applause to Michaela Loach. The, my shoulder, just, just underneath you. Is that Perfect. good? Yes. Yeah. That's good, isn't it, Myrie? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Myrie looks happy with the position of the microphone. Nice. Excellent. I'm so excited. Me too. Uh, welcome wow. back to Edinburgh and Thank welcome you. to the Roxy and your actual book launch or pre book launch. Yeah, it, <laughs> it technically like publishes exactly a week today. But given that my graduation was happening today, this felt like it had to happen. So, and Lighthouse is my favorite bookstore. So, this is the most perfect yeah. thing ever. So and consider I, yourselves like a, a very kind of, you know, pre-VIP basically mm, crowd. Mm. Um, yes, yeah, so if you get the book now, you're getting it a week early, so you might as well get, you know, some extra copies for people you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna hear a little bit from the book in a moment, um, mm. but I wanted to ask you first about having done a podcast, having worked with climate communication in many, many different forms, uh, why the need for a book? Where did that mm. need come from? Mm. That to, to actually sit down and write it as a book that would be in bookstores and be sold to people who go to bookshops, basically. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good question because I think sometimes we can wonder, like, what's the point of like writing or art in a world that's on fire? Um, but I think I think a lot to um, how much writing or or books have impacted me and how much that that kind of um, really kind of unique experience of spending like maybe 10 or more hours with a person mm -hmm. and having this kind of strange conversation through um, through reading um, has really kind of transformed me as a person and as, and as well that I think that what's so important with me and all of the work that I do, I really want to reach outside of the bubble and I think that with the Yikes podcast we were still kind of within a lot of climate spaces it's, it's managed to like reach a lot of people for sure and through social media as well. But I think there's a, there is a way in which I think that 
a book can have a bigger impact on, on a person. It's, it, I know that how much they've impacted like my journey throughout life. Um, and also I wanted to be able to like get into like the nuance of stuff that you can't really get into in like a half an hour podcast or like let alone like a 30 second reel on Instagram. Um, and so I really wanted to like be able to get into kind of the, the meatiness of, um, of climate justice and how expansive it is, um, but also to be able to represent it with like the nuance that I think it deserves as well. Uh, what was the feeling like? It was like, I'm, I'm going to write a book about this now. What kind of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you know, how did you yeah. find like your own way of working, I suppose? Mm. Mm. I think it was one of the hardest things I've done because it's so solitary. I'm so mm. used to doing stuff with other people all the time. Like, especially organising, it's something that you do together. Like, everyone has their roles and everyone does their thing. Um, but this was me having to, like be quite strict with myself and be like, I'm gonna sit in front of my laptop alone for days and days and days and days and days at a time um, and, and believe that I can write an entire book. I think that um, I went through a lot of imposter syndrome during the writing process, I think because climate justice is, is such a big topic um, and it encompasses the struggles of so many different people. I also just didn't wanna like let a movement that I care about so much down like and that was a big thing that I think that stopped me from writing for a long time and um, dur even during the writing process that I'd be too scared of writing that I um I didn't write <laughs> and then I realized that actually um once you have something on on the page then you can actually do something with it and then you can work on it and then you can improve it but um but I had to do a lot of I think work on on myself my own, own fear and what was kind of getting in 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 the way of that um but at the same time I learned so much whilst writing it and that's what I think was such a huge privilege that I got to spend every day for like almost a year um just learning about this um this kind of whole movement that I care about so much um in and really like have to challenge myself on if I'm going to write something down I have to really understand it and really like know all of the the kind of why, if so, I would, when I was writing, I'd think like, oh, if I'm going to write this, someone might think, oh, but what about this? What about this? And you really then start kind of understanding things on a depth that I think I wasn't able to have the time to do beforehand. Um, and I think it's made me a much better communicator. I, it's quite funny that when I was doing interviews after having written the book, I was like, wow, everything feels so much easier now. I wonder why that is. <laughs> like, all these things, it just comes a lot easier. And I'm like, oh, I spent a long time, like, working all this stuff out. Um, so that, that should actually make a bit of sense. Yeah, it's interesting what you say. It's almost like you kind of have to second guess yourself and be a yeah. step ahead and be like, what will the reader wonder about? Exactly. And I think that's what's hard because then you they do start second guessing yourself yeah. as well. Yeah. But I think it's an important part of, especially given that the point of this book is to reach outside of the existing bubble of, of people who are already organizing or already doing um, this work um, and try and show people who, the majority of people already care about the climate crisis. They just don't know what to do about it. Um, and the point of this book was to be like there is so much that we can do this isn't just about doom and gloom um it's about hope and transformation and building a better world um and so in order to kind of um convince people of that um it yeah it means like addressing the doubts that currently exist um and and also like honoring those doubts as like real concerns as well and therefore how can you like actually address them rather than I think sometimes we can be a bit like too dismissive um, yeah taking yeah. them seriously mm, for sure mm -hmm. so let's hear a little bit from the book okay. uh, I mean obviously there's just you could have chosen so many bits from this book. <laughs> but I think this is a really good choice. That's cool. That's cool. I chose this about five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> some people might have seen me like scuttle towards the front and ask my mother for what she thought was the best bit. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm just going to read a bit about... Um, oh, it's in the introduction, so it's quite near the start, but I'll, I'll just I'll go ahead and read it and start talking about it. The undeniable truth is that the climate crisis is the biggest issue facing us all collectively. But that doesn't require us to leave our hopes, dreams, desires, or struggles at the door in order to fight for this cause. The fact that the climate crisis is inherently woven together with oppressive systems of white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy, both in its causation and its impacts, means that this crisis doesn't ask us to leave behind what we're already fighting for, but instead to find a way to connect our struggles, our dreams, and our liberated futures together so that we are more likely to achieve them all. For me, as a young, for me, as a young black Jamaican British woman, growing up in a world where both climate breakdown and violent white supremacy were prevalent in the headlines and experiences of my loved ones, it was this realization that brought me to this work. The reality that climate action is not, about, is not only about preventing apocalypse. It's not only about saving my birth island from being fully submerged by rising sea levels. Climate justice, the principle this book is based on, allows us the real possibility of creating a better world for all of us 
a world in which the people who are currently most impacted by the climate crisis are not just saved from climate collapse, but the material conditions for the lives of the most marginalized are also transformed for the better. It offers us a real shot at achieving liberation for every single person, but only if we decide to build it. Now that's something to fight for. It's absolutely essential for you to understand whenever you're reading this book, whether it's just after its publication or 10 years from now, that it is never too late to take action. It is literally never too late to act to make the world even a little bit better for our fellow humans. Every single fraction of a degree of warming that we can prevent matters. Every single fraction. Every fraction of a degree will result in a fellow human being's life being made safer or saved. That matters. It will never not matter. Please do not give in to doom and despair. Please do not give up. I won't talk about timelines or when it will be too late to act in this book. The use of timelines or countdown clocks are not as useful as we might think. Yes, when it comes to climate change, time frames and urgency really do matter. There are tipping points and there are time frames in which some impacts will be made irreversible if adequate action is not taken. But I often feel that the countdown clocks give us the false impression that we can wait eight years or 10 years or any time other than right now to take action. It makes us think that we can afford to wait a little longer when the reality is that these timelines require us to start immediately. They require drastic and urgent action right now. This work cannot wait. To say that it's never too late to act is not to remove or detract from the urgency of the situation, but instead to say that I believe deep in my soul that there will never become a point at which acting to transform the world for the better isn't worthwhile. I don't want anyone to ever believe that they can't do anything now because they didn't do something before. Whenever you're reading this, whatever has happened, it is never too late to begin to take actions that will make our world a better place. Any wins we can achieve really do matter, but ultimately, radical change is what's needed, rather than inter incremental change. The time for slow changes has been and gone. The time for reformism has been and gone. We are now fighting climate change delayers more than climate change deniers. Both of them are equally deadly. And I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, you mentioned just before your reading about how writing about climate justice is like bringing together so many things. Mm. Um, and I wonder what the, what the sort of challenges are when starting to write a book that is not about finding a niche mm. and is not about focusing on one narrative. Mm. And if you, you know, how, what was it to, to try and like, put that idea out there because surprisingly you know we talked about this before like there's even within kind of climate justice and climate activism literature it tends to be and maybe this is to do with the publishing industry that mm -hmm. it tends to be quite niche and it mm -hmm. tends to focus on like individual aspects and your book doesn't it is bringing together all of this mm -hmm. stuff so what was it like to try and like put that out there I I think this this book is kind of about like knitting all the bits mm -hmm. together I think and that um it's not, it's not the, the easiest thing to do, but it's, I think it's, that's what will really motivate people to actually transform the world around us. I think that, um, as I said before, I think a lot of the kind of like hesitation or the lack of action actually just comes from like a feeling that there's like not much that we can do or that they, people have been told that climate is just about like recycling or like a future issue rather than like a very present threat. But when, when we connect this like huge crisis um, and, the rea and, and kind of illuminate the reality of it that it is inherently connected in its kind of causation and, and its origins to all of these same systems that are currently causing people harm today in so many different ways and, and that all of us are being harmed by um, in different ways. That's when we think we can give like a kind of more hopeful perspective. But at, at first, a lot of people didn't get it, like especially in publishing, um, a lot of like agents I spoke to just didn't understand what I what I meant. <laughs> um, I think that because they they see climate books as just being about science, or like I think that a lot of climate books have been siloed into, yeah, the science genre, or they've been all about like, oh, we're all screwed, so there's nothing we can do. And I, I don't really know why people would want to sit. And, th and then there's this belief that people don't read climate books. And I think it's because they've all been about like we're all screwed. And I don't think many of us want to sit down for ten hours and read like we're all screwed. I think that. Um, I think what we kind of need is something that's going to kind of move us into action and galvanize us and make us believe there's some hope. Um, and so that's what I was trying to do, like, um, throughout it. And even though the bit that I've just read seems a bit, like, quite serious, um, and it is, it is a very serious book, um, 
it is it's it is a hopeful book i would um and that was really really important to me um and especially like the last chapter is all about hope and kind of drawing and drawing how we can find hope from these interconnections that i think too often in the climate movement have been talked about as like a distraction i think that they're actually the opposite they are like they are what will allow us to achieve this better world is is that knitting together of all of these realities and um, it's not a distraction it's actually the kind of the fuel that will get us there and i think that um we we, we don't have the kind of we, we can't we can't leave it we can't wait any longer um to make these connections and um we've we've failed thus far in, in not making them because it won't be real change yeah exactly yeah. and i think it's that's the thing is i think like the majority of people are, are like suffering in many different ways because of capitalism and because of white supremacy and all these other issues like whether it's the fact that people like live in insecure housing or it's the fact that we're in like a cost of living crisis which even as like a term is like so messed up like cost of living like that's yeah. the cost of being able to live like that's wild and and uh, when meanwhile there's like a very small percentage of the world who are making huge amounts of profit which is being extracted from the majority of people i think that like um we are seeing like a redistribution of wealth or a transfer of wealth that we like haven't seen as as big in in the past now but, but it's in going in the wrong direction like we aren't redistributing wealth from the rich to the poor like the the rich are becoming an even smaller and smaller amount of people and they're extracting that from the majority of people and i think that given that people are starting to realize how bad capitalism is i think in particular um this is like of course the time to show that we can provide an alternative that's better rather than just what the climate movement has done i think too often is like say oh like the success is maintaining this world as exactly as it is and i'm like what it's kind of this world's kind of messed up yeah, i'm not sure if that's yeah. like that exciting i think that um we should instead be offering like an alternative yeah it's like how many people would agree with that yeah <laughs> no exactly um speaking of of making connections um I wonder if so, one of the things about colonialism mm -hmm. is that it's divide and conquer, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, di di literally putting, um, drawing borders on maps and, and deciding that this is one country and this is the other, re regardless of anything else. And and I feel like you, you do kind of see this even in climate activism and that groups that should have, a, or do have a common enemy mm -hmm. and that should be working together are somehow not. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if this is anything, if there's a connection between that and the way that we are told that we're alone in this and mm -hmm. that we can kind of buy ourselves out of this by consuming um, this mm -hmm. soap instead of the other soap. Like mm -hmm. what kind of, what is there to gain, do you think, in dividing people like that, both in terms of climate mm -hmm. activism, but in terms of like our everyday lives as well? I mean, there's there's so much to, yeah, that I think that the status quo gained from making us believe that we are like individual people whose lives are not connected to each other. Um, and there's, there's a whole chapter on individualism versus collectivism, which like tries to dive into the importance of us like resisting that kind of individual narrative. Um, because even like like workers who don't talk to each other about their conditions they're facing are so much easier to control than workers that like talk about their shared struggle or the fact that they're all being harmed in similar ways. And the same as like all of us, like if we don't talk to each other about or, or, and connect with each other and work together, we are so much weaker like as sole people. But I think that we've been told like over time, and sorry that I keep talking in and out, but I'm like, there's people here as well. Um, <laughs> um, We've been told that like all big changes or all great things that happen are just the like work of individual heroes, and that makes us believe that like we are alone and, and that things aren't as connected. Um, but I think one of the most important things for us to remember is that all of our lives are so inherently connected um, globally as well. Like my, I think this is something that I try and reflect on quite a lot is that my life is so connected to the people who have made my clothes who, may, who I might not see all the people who have grown the food that I eat who I also all the people who have like I don't know put fertilizer on that I don't know all these people whose whose lives I might not see as like as, um, pro as proximal as my own or the people around me our lives and our livelihoods are, are connected to each other and what I choose to do with my life impacts those people and what um, and therefore, the, what the people who kind of own industry choose to do their life impacts my life and impacts... And, and all of us are so... Like, all of our lives are so inherently connected. And so I think that recognising that as a reality... And then if we can recognise, like, how everything is connected in that way, we can realise if we form our own connections with each other and grow strong movements, we can actually be so much more powerful 
um, than when we are like divided from each other. But I do think there has been this narrative, I and mean, it's like a product of a lot of different things, but like especially like Margaret Thatcher's neoliberalism and all that kind of jazz. Um, jazz, that but jazz. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is to like to to yeah to tell us that we're on our own. Um, because we're easier to control, um, but also when it comes to climate, I think we've made, been made to believe, and it benefits the fossil fuel industry for us to think like, oh, it's your fault, you individual person. Like it's about your carbon footprint. It's about um, the, what you, how you live your life, rather than the fact that there are like 20 companies that are responsible for a third of all greenhouse gas emissions since um, the pre-industrial period. Like it's much easier to um, to shift the blame away if they distract us by making us think about ourselves. And I think that we can actually. Um, kind of challenge that um, kind of distraction tactic by instead like coming together and, and using our collective power against them, which would be so much more powerful than if we all spent all of our time like worrying about our own lives that are in many ways like determined by the choices that people with much more power than ourselves make. Uh, speaking of media, I mean, because you, you've worked with media loads, uh, what do you think is the role of the media in terms of, I'm thinking about workers, for example, like in the oil industry or in mm. different, um, being sort of seen as com in wanting something else than climate activists mm -hmm. and those mm. being almost like portrayed as two warring factions when actually you know. it, it's, it's very similar to kind of like the invention of like race like mm. race was invented in order to divide like white working class people especially like irish indentured um workers um and the enslaved african populations in barbados like it was invented to, to divide people who have a common enemy from coming together and realizing that there's a shared struggle i think that in in a similar way that's been happening with like mm -hmm. oil industry workers and the climate movement like we have a shared foe which is the like oil and gas executives and, and bosses who are causing harm to both the workers by like giving really bad conditions um and like really insecure jobs and obviously to the planet as well and that is that is a shared struggle but we've been we've been continually divided and that's why that focusing and not like leaving behind messaging of like a just transition and messaging of like these connections is so so important because otherwise we kind of create a space for those like divide and conquer narratives mm -hmm. to um to kind of to wreak havoc everywhere um, yeah, yeah. and so connecting our struggles is, is so so important what kind of um, coalitions mm. would you like to see becoming stronger mm. in the next, you know, wee while? <laughs> I, th I think especially like coalitions between, that have already kind of been starting, especially with lots of folks who did some incredible work with the COP26 coalition and worked a lot with with trade unions and the climate movement. I and mean, I know that there are folks in here who did a lot of that work, so like big up, big up all of you. Um, but continuing that kind of work and those relationships I think is so, so important because I think that even since that time, like maybe those relationships have started to like weaken mm. in some respect, especially um, with even with like kind of the new campaigns like Enough is Enough and all of these kind of cost of living against cost of living crisis campaigns. It's important that we also as a climate movement incorporate and, and understand the connections that, that these very like present struggles have with the climate crisis as well and don't abandon those because I think that that's where like a coalition comes out of like both sides of folks being like we're gonna back each other and it and it takes I think some it takes normally sometimes one one group to step into that and be like I'm we're going to begin this conversation but then there needs to be yeah there needs to be that kind of relationship and I think that perhaps like I think the climate movement has done a lot to to maintain that but I think we could be doing um a bit more to strengthen those relationships and I but there have been so many that have, like amazing coalitions that have happened in the past that like I talk about often um, in the book of like the Rainbow Coalition with, with the Black Panthers and um, white working class people with the white patriots and um, Puerto Rican activists. And I think that those like previous kind of examples give me a lot of, of hope because those groups seem to have almost um, more animosity towards each other than I think a lot of the groups that we're trying to yeah. unite today. And so if if folks have managed to make that work before, we need to kind of learn from those struggles and how can we apply that here as well. I mean, you said something really key that um, that it's about showing up for, mm. for the other person, because maybe I wonder if, if often the working together has been seen as like, come on, join me, mm, mm -hmm, <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna support you and what 
you need doing and your needs. Yeah. Um, is that something that you think the climate movement needs to kind of work on? Or? I I, th I think so. I think I do. I can. Re I think from people that I have, from conversations that I have heard have happened, mm -hmm. that is what has been perceived by some like union organisers mm -hmm. as more of the climate movement seeing that their movements are doing really well in public opinion and wanting to kind of like get on on that um and so i think it's really important to like yeah to realize that it's about this kind of like mutual relationship and and, and support but that it's going to take someone kind of stepping out for that because i mean in an example i use in the book of crip camp um mm -hmm. and the 504 sit-in which was like these disability activists um were occupying a u.s government building to try and um, advocate for them to have civil rights in in the u.s before there was like the disability rights act and part of that black panthers just came and like gave food and like care that was needed and that was just them giving support without kind of like some sort of other motive it was more of like realizing that um our struggles are intertwined and our liberation is intertwined and i think that yeah i guess maybe like those kind of things of providing some like material support is also important but i've seen so many people like i've seen so many groups doing that and it's been really great to see like so many groups been showing up on um on picket lines with with supportive slogans or things like that but i think it's maybe working out I and mean, we're working out how we can do that in or we're maybe listening more actually to folks like what do people actually need rather than mm -hmm. us assuming that i think maybe that would be helpful is that is it also something to do with um daring to do work that's invisible mm. uh, because which kind of brings me to something you said about earlier about the the obsession with leaders and you talk about that in in your book um really wonderfully how it, there is this obsession with heroes and mm -hmm. Partly, it it kind of keeps us in a passive place, but mm -hmm. also it keeps us from actually thinking about collectives. And I, what I wanted to ask you about was actually specifically about social media. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, how, you know, what is the role of social media in this, I wonder? Because in some ways, it's just incredibly useful. Mm. Um, in spreading information, but at the same time, it is about individuals yeah. to some extent. So, I'm just really curious to hear, like, what is your what mm. is your experience of that? Um, I think that social media, like, can remove like the focus on the invisibilized work or the invisible work that that is really necessary and important. And I have noticed this kind of happening that maybe there's like a lack of um willingness to do a lot of the invisible work because i think to some extent and this is something that emma dabry also writes about quite a lot of mm -hmm. like um being seen has come before like actually changing things or, or doing things mm -hmm. um and I, I i do i do worry about that i know that a lot of folks do and i, and I mean i have this really difficult relationship with social media because obviously i use it a lot and people are very aware of that um and I try and use it as a tool for mm. good, but I often like sit and I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. Because mm. it, is a, it is a platform that like br exists on individualism. Like a, if a group is on social media, they're going to get way less engagement than if they are an individual. And, it's, and it, that is just kind of how it works. And I'm so aware of like, I will try and like use it as a tool in a way and, and use that understanding as a tool of being like, oh, realizing that there's, there is already a platform around me on social media, for example, and that is around me as an individual, which is really weird and, and uncomfortable in some ways. Um, but trying to use that as a tool of like, oh, if this already exists and this is already here, how can that have like a, a beneficial impact? Mm -hmm. um, but then it is still difficult because there is still this like pedestaling that happens like of of me that I, that I, um, that I this is one bit that I was like, so like, oh, do I include this? Do I not include this when I was in the book? Because it was quite personal of like my experience of, um, growing on social media and um, going from like a nobody <laughs> to or still nobody, but um, but who people had started following because black people were murdered and people felt guilty and then started mm. following me um, in the beginning, um, and then going from like having if I was involved with actions often or like so, so like protests or like I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, if we went and like shouted at people at oil events or something. Um, if I'd been involved with it, like my contributions were often like obscured previously because of anti-blackness and stuff like that. And then suddenly like gaining a platform and suddenly anything that happens, I must have done it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even though, even if I had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where I think social media sometimes can like um, give like warped views of how change happens in a similar way of like how we're told 
that throughout history it was just like two people who changed everything. Like it was just MLK and Malcolm X and no one else was there. Um, <laughs> when like that's obviously not true. But I think that social media does a similar. Th it does it. Do it does a similar thing in in that way. And it, and it's. I think from my perspective, I'm just. I just try and often like say, please don't pedestal me. Mm -hmm. And I am not perfect. And I am not. A he I don't want to be anyone's hero. Um, and I don't want to be like a lead, the leader. Like I think we want leader full movements rather than like um, just having one person who is everything. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I I think that we can. But then there's this thing where like I think this is why I had a lot of um, imposter syndrome when writing the book as well because um, I think through social media we can think like oh the person who has the most followers is doing the most work or something which is just ridiculous mm -hmm. because I'm so aware that I know so many incredible wonderful people who do like far more work than I than I do because uh, in in different ways um, and work that is made invisible and work that isn't celebrated and work that doesn't get like this is why, it, I mean, I'll get offered, like, awards, and I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> like, it feels weird, like, um, because I know that it's not about me. It's about, like, a collective struggle. And I think that, I think that was another, sorry, I feel like I'm, like, staying this, like, you know, stream of consciousness to everyone. But um, that, <laughs> um, but that was, I guess, going back to that was another reason why I wanted to, to, to write the book, to try and make it a bit less, weirdly, to try and make it a bit less about me and about the ideas, I think, because it's not... Like, you know, there's not photos of, there's not a single, apart from the author photo, there's not, like, photos of me in it, whereas on social media I have to, like, post a photo and then be like, come to this protest. Um, and I think that um, it's a bit of a weird thing. As you can tell, my brain goes a bit weird when I talk about this stuff, um, so but apologies I, for that. I mean, I asked the question because I thought it was so great that mm. you had that section in the book, and it was so fascinating and, and you know, moving to read about that mm -hmm. experience and and it actually made me think about another section of the book where you talk about um the lawsuit and mm -hmm. if it's like do we work within the system or outside mm -hmm. the system and and in this case you know social media is here and mm -hmm. this is the world that we are in so mm -hmm. the question is like do you do you engage with the world as it is yeah not? especially as like social media apps also like exist to like colonize our attention like they they want to like take as much of your time away from you as possible they want you to like sit on this and i do wonder sometimes like oh by making content am i taking people's time away from their lives but then i realized that like these apps are going to be filled with like a bunch of people saying some whack stuff and like <laughs> if i can add some like <laughs> non <-whack>. like non whack <laughs> stuff <laughs> into the mix or if i can try and like I don't know, I say sometimes, you know, I lure people in with the, like, big pink outfits and they stay for the climate justice. And, um, like, if, if, if we can try and use the, the... But see them as tools. Like, don't see it as this is the be-all or end-all. And, like, do constantly, like, critique them and do, like, openly critique them and don't, and don't over... Put too much, like, emphasis on them. I think that it's, like, how do we... How do we see it as a tool? And how... Do, like, if... If, like, all social media apps like disappeared tomorrow like what would your work look like and um would you still be doing this work um and i think that that's a question that i ask myself all the time it's a question i think we should all ask ourselves all the time and make it so that we are these things are just tools and we can apply the same even if this is the tool that is necessary for you to use now how could you be applying that elsewhere as well and also like not getting distracted by like virality or like views or numbers or things like that because i think that that can be such a distraction of like the really like long and hard work that is is necessary um and also like the work that's actually like building power rather than just building visibility i think those are two different things um and i think that we often can conflate them too often um and yeah i think yeah it's it's, it's a tricky one it's a tricky yeah. one that's such a great question though to keep in mind like like if if it didn't exist mm. tomorrow what would my work look like yeah. and and use that as a basis mm. uh, with regards to what brings people to maybe getting involved um, with climate justice work. You know, you, you talk about, and even in the bit where, that you read out, how uh, doom scenarios aren't particularly useful. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you know, many of us are often very afraid. Yeah. Um, and that can be, I guess, galvanizing for some people. So I, I wondered, mm now what do you see as like a role the role of fear or even mm. grief mm. in 
your work and has that changed over the last few years? I, wonder. I think it has changed a lot. Um, I think that when I'm, I think when I say that I don't think fear like works as a great motivator, um, I think a lot of that comes from the fact that I think it's hard to like scare people a second time. That's something that mm. Octavia E. Butler writes about. Um, and I think I think of it like me and my little brother, we would constantly try and like, I still actually try and jump scare everyone, <laughs> but um, we would like hide behind a corner um, and like try and scare each other all the time. But if, you, if someone's done it to you once in the same place, and they do it to you again, you're going to know it's coming and it's not going to work in the same way, you're not going to have the same reaction. I think that, that we do that almost too often with, with climate. I think that we're like, I think part of it comes from us wanting to simulate like how we started to care. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of us came into these space from a place of, of fear of the reality. I know that I, I would like, I remember like when I was um, like in my first couple years at uni here, like lying in bed awake, mm -hmm. um, being like, oh my gosh, this is so terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of that fear came from feeling like we could, didn't, I didn't think we could do anything about it. Like, yeah, or feeling exactly. like the best, or the, I, the, the only thing that I was, at the time, the thing I was doing was like, you know, grinding my own peanut butter and making my own oat milk. Um, and I was like, while I'd be like making that oat milk, I'd be like, this is definitely not enough for like this big <laughs> crisis. But that's what we, I was being told was like, oh, you know, yeah. Just gotta gotta make your own oat milk, and then yeah. that will solve the whole climate crisis. Um, and, and it's petrifying as well. You end yeah. up not not able to live. <laughs> yeah, well, we, well, yeah, because also I think I was also spending at that time. I was spending like all my time going to like five different zero, zero waste shops because that's what yeah. I was told to also do. Was yeah. like, oh, you know, reduce all your plastic, and that's what save everything. And um, I think that it just I just didn't feel like that was like it, I could feel that wasn't enough, and that's where I think a lot of the fear came from. Was like, oh, this definitely isn't enough. And I think a lot of that fear for me kind of um, was transformed, I would say, rather than like went away. Um, when I got involved with like movements and organizing and realized that we can actually build power that can really change things and that in a similar way that like things have changed in the past, we can change things now using similar tactics. Um, so I don't think that, I think fear does have, a, have a, it's, it's re, I don't want to deny the existence of it. I think it's, it's there and it's, and it's important. I think I just want to like transform it rather than want people to live in it. I think that and also, there's loads of brilliant, amazing communicators and loads of brilliant, amazing climate books as well. And I'm not saying this is the only good climate book. Um, but I think that too often we can almost want to like keep people in that fear space and think that that's what will cause mm -hmm. action. But I think that when we're afraid, we freeze like, and we don't do anything. Um, whereas when we like can transform that into something else, then we can actually do something about it. Um, but I think, I mean, grief plays like a huge role in my like climate grief I think plays a huge role in my life for sure I mean I write about um how when I started writing this book it was actually kind of inspired by conversations with my grandma who is who's is sitting over there um, um who's come over from Jamaica for for the book stuff and for my graduation which is very lovely um but I moved over to Jamaica at the start of writing this um and uh, I'd said to grandma like let's go to Helsha Beach which is the beach that so I was born in Jamaica, but we only lived there for a couple of years. But in my childhood, when we go back, we'd always go to Hellshire and we'd um, play on the beach. And I have all these photos of me as a kid um, playing on that beach and so many memories there. Um, and on the phone, grandma just being like, um, that beach, it's not there anymore. Like, she's, she's gone because of hurricanes and um, rising sea levels and impact and kind of consequences of the climate crisis. Um, and that beach is only like a 10 minute drive away from where grandma lives now and, and a lot of my family live um, and, and even closer to that there's like so many communities that live like right on the coast there and when we were living in Jamaica like when we'd go around the island you could literally see like sorry it actually makes me quite emotional but you could see like the like water levels where flooding has happened and harm people and people have lost their homes already I think also I cry like every event I do so that's so grief is a big part of but I think that it's like so we should be upset about this yeah. stuff and like it should like break our hearts in some way. And I think that, but it's about what do we do with that heartbreak? Like, do we, do we just sit in it? And do we like, cause it's almost like, is it quite a privilege to, to like be able to sit in the heartbreak of it and not have to do anything about it? Cause there are so many communities around the world who do not have the privilege of sitting in the heartbreak. Like they, like the indigenous communities that um, many of us work with um, in solidarity with, like they, the stories that they tell us is like they, don't have a choice but to act because okay. that is their life, and so it is a privilege to be able to just sit in, to sit in the doom, and and that's why I think that if, if we can do something, we we should we should, and if we, and I think what that heartbreak should do to us is um is move us forward rather than like hold us in the same space, 
and I think that what, and what I write about near the end is like we need to find like that thing that like brings us personally into this movement and that breaks our heart but also that like vision of a transformed future that mends that broken heart um, and I think that it's in the space like between those two that you'll find what your fight is um, and that you'll find what you what will really keep you in this movement for the for the long run because yeah I don't I I think honoring that grief is so important um but I think almost we focus I think we can almost give too much focus on on that and not on the like what's going to move us forward and beyond that and what's yeah. going to what's going to mend that and maybe that's related to the fighting against and the fighting for mm -hmm. as well which is so difficult to kind mm -hmm. of get a, a balance we spend mm -hmm. so much time fighting against mm -hmm. that it's like what are we what are we fighting for no, and I think yeah. we've seen I've seen that a lot in like a lot of spaces and I think that we just need to we need to have something to fight for, not only just to like mend our broken hearts and to keep us going, but also to like provide something that is like attractive to people to join. Like I think that, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that that vision of a of a better future is that's what kind of brought me into these movements. Is like for me growing up, I saw climate as like this like I don't know this white people problem of like oh you don't have that many things to worry about, you can talk about the climate crisis, and I was like there are more immediate problems facing people who look like me or um, or my like family back in Jamaica um but it was realizing this like reality that we can like liberate the world and we can transform it um and even in talking now I have this thing that I do when I start getting the heartbreak I don't ignore it I acknowledge it and I give myself the space for it but I already like mentally start being like how am I going to get how am I going to move this into doing something and it's it's I think I talked about it recently about the IPCC report on social media I it's like this thing in my head where I'm like um I think some therapists can tell you like, oh, any any bad day, you can just tell yourself better. Obviously that's not good all the time, but in a sense with climate, I think sometimes you can view things of like, oh, you could just stay in the bad stuff or you could think like, what can we do about this? And, and, and choose every moment to be like, what can we do about this instead of just sitting in the like, oh, this is really, really quite shit. Instead it's yeah, moving it on. And there's like yeah. a prerequisite for change, isn't mm. it? Because if, you, if you're not feeling it at all, mm. then there is just no, way to transform anything I absolutely and, and also if you're not feeling it then I think you're just like you get a bit lost I think I like in what you're doing and I think that it's that's why when I say this it's not about like shoving the feelings down mm. I don't think that's the solution like don't shove it down it's still going to be there and it's going to fester um it's about how do we like honor that feeling in a way that you're like transforming it and moving it into something else um and I think yeah I think that we can try and shove it down too much and that that just can make us a bit like apathetic and and not have that same kind of like heart motivation behind what we're doing um we are going to open up to questions in a second and i i promised myself that this was gonna, it wasn't going to be my last question <laughs> but it probably will be anyway um i just feel like anyone who writes about writes a book about in any way to do with climate justice uh, the interview always ends with a question about hope <laughs> so i sort of didn't want to do that um but I'm gonna ask you about hope. Uh, very specifically though, uh, the question that I've heard a lot is what gives you hope? Mm. Which I don't necessarily think is the right question mm. because it's a very passive view of hope. It's like, oh, well, is hope something that I'm supposed to like receive to mm. just walk around and kind of, it just falls from the sky sort of thing. So I'm gonna ask you um, more, when do you feel that you're creating hope? Ooh, I like that because I always get asked the like, oh, what gives you hope? Yeah. And um, I think I always respond by being like, that's not the question you should be asking. Yeah, so I'm exactly. Glad. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you've um, Speak from experience. You've done that. But I've now forgotten what the question was that you actually asked. <laughs> because I was um, yeah, if you can think of moments, when do you feel that you are creating hope? Mm -hmm. I, I think that f for me, um, I think we, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this really cheesy thing that I've said so many times, but there's this like, really brilliant quote by Aaron Dusty Roy about like another world is on her way on a quiet day and we can hear her breathing and um I'm sorry if you've heard me say this about a billion times but um I think that I I do try and like pay attention to where in my life can I like feel that that breath like where where is it and that and and I think I came to realize that like I can only really feel that breath when like I'm in organizing spaces with people and we're like not just sitting in like or not just talking about stuff we're like doing something we're building something whether it was like I remember so like clearly when we um 
were all together when the Cambo oil field was like not um, was indefinitely paused by Sick Point Energy and when Shell dropped off and just feeling like and 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 then but us also like celebrating it but then immediately being like so what do we do next mm -hmm. and how do we like and how do we take down the entire fossil fuel industry um mm -hmm. and it was and I think that it's in those moments when like you're with other people and you're like you're choosing like against like huge odds that ask you to be apathetic that like tell you to that it's too late or tell you not to do anything that instead like it's a deliberate choice to be like we are gonna we are going to do something about this um, and we're going to do it together and we're not going to do it alone. Um, and we aren't going to like, oh gosh, sorry. Um, we aren't going to let like doom and gloom be our only narrative. We are going to um, choose to to really try and transform the world um, around us. And it's in those moments that I realise that like we become that breath because I think too, some, too often, I think, I, I mean, I even probably have done this too much as well, that we talk about like the world we're fighting for is this like, future like day or something I don't know like mm -hmm. the revolution or like the better world when actually like I think that the better world or the revolution or whatever like it's not the it's like a thing that we're building every single day like when we choose to act and when we choose to be active um and it when it's not going to come on there's not like going to be like an end date it's something that we choose to build more and more of every single day when, when we um when we decide to be active in those spaces and so I think that that's that's when hope is and I think like yeah I think it's not something that you can be given I don't think I don't know I think that I have seen other people create hope and like seen that from afar but I don't think that um I don't like this whole idea of like oh we can just sit around because other people are going to give us hope I'm like no, no 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 we have to become that breath of a new world we have to like um come together we have to create that hope um and there's nothing that will like give you hope more than being part of creating it, I think, and building that new world, because you realize that it's like a tangible thing. It's not this like flimsy, like um, other thing as well. So I guess that's what I would say. Yeah. I've always thought of that Arundhati Roy quote as like, like there's a veil and that world already exists on the other side mm. of the veil. And it's like, there's little rips in the veil. And sometimes you're like, ooh, mm. <laughs> there it is. Mm, I like uh, that, that's yeah. nice, yeah, yeah. I, I think we're doing the little rips. That's yeah. what I see it as like, you know, we're like, yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of like those like scratch yeah, yeah. there's like scratch maps i don't know yes, we're like scratching exactly. off part of the scratch map like, um and yeah so it's not like maybe in that way there would be a full map maybe the metaphor does not work there but you, you get the point <laughs> yeah. scratch map whatever works for you yeah that's good um we've got a roaming microphone uh, so if you have a question for Michaela, please raise your hand. And if you're in the back and have a question, our mic won't reach you. So if you can go up to the front on this side to Myrie, who will give you a mic, way. that will be fantastic. Over here, the mic is here. So if you want to come forward. Ma and waiting. while you make your way forward, there is uh, a question online um, from Malika, who says, um, love how you always champion other writing. What other books most shaped or inspired your writing? Mm. Um, Emma Dabry's What White People Can Do Next, I think, is what um, gave me a kick up the bum to actually write this, um, because I think I had got back into the mode of, like, gosh, writing a book is going to take a lot of time. Maybe that time would be better spent, like, doing the kind of practical organising work. Um, but reading that book really transformed a lot of the ways I think, and, I, and not just for myself, but for other people and the ways I thought about things. So I think that that had a really big impact and, like, kind of her punchy way of just, like, kind of no bullshit, I guess, getting to the point. Um, Aaron, uh, sorry, Aaron, sorry, um, Audrey Lord's work like um, has transformed my life, I would say, especially her essay on the uses of the erotic. Um, that's what made me like take a year out from med school and move to Jamaica. Um, I literally read that essay and was like, I'm taking my life, I'm, I'm gonna like connect with my ancestral lands, I'm gonna um, follow those, those things. Um, and that's in the kind of your, the, the pink book, that is on the shelf in Lighthouse is where that essay is. Um, Your silence will not protect That's it. it. That's the name. Yeah, it's a collection of essays and, and speeches. And I like that how Audrey Lord writes as if it's spoken, which is something that I really like. So I feel like it's really accessible. Um, so I think I find a lot of like um, more academic writing like a bit harder, but I feel like she like kind of talks to you as if you're a, it's like a pal, um, which I really enjoy um, as well. So I think that those those two I think would be the ones I'd say like really impact. And as well, um, when writing. I mean, there's loads of books like I mentioned. There's also like a reading list in it as well because I wanted to like honor all of the folks that um, have impacted um, my writing. Um, but A People's Green New Deal by Max Isle, I read it whilst writing the book 
and it's so good. It's really, really good. I'd really recommend. But I, it's not like it, it's. I think it's for folks who already are in like climate stuff. You kind of that, that kind of assumes quite a lot of knowledge. I think, but but it's chef's kiss. It's really good. Would really recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Michaela. Uh, thank you so much for this. I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, I I've just been thinking about something a lot recently since the recent IPCC report. Um, and the kind of headline that they went for for that report was, you know, a livable future is still possible. And this phrase, a livable future, has been kind of going around in my mind because I, like, they didn't define it really, um, mm -hmm. what it meant. Um, and, you know, it could mean so many things. You know, it could be a, a future in which we merely survive or mm -hmm. one in which we thrive. Or, and, you know, a liv livable for who? Livable for mm -hmm. people here or livable for, you know, people in the global south? Um, but from your perspective, as someone who is kind of offering hope here today, um, mm -hmm. I'd love to know like, what your vision for a livable future would be if you could kind of imagine, you know, mm -hmm. let your imagination roam. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, and like, yeah, I think that you're, you're so right on that use of livable future. I think the, because, I, yeah, it's livable for who. And I think the reason why a lot of us use it is because people can understand like what that means. Or sometimes if you say like a climate safe future or like, within the boundaries of our planet. Sometimes we're like, what, what the hell does that mean? Um, but I think it's important for us to, to like be reflecting on, on what future we're creating, because I, I will get to the, to the, the, the future. Um, but we need to remember that like, the reality is the world as we are now, like, climate, climate stuff is gonna happen. Like, we are gonna have to stop using fossil fuels. We are gonna, like, and, and I mean from like, all the political spectrum, like, this is gonna happen because there are already agreements and things like that. It's, it's about when and it's about how and it's about who's protected and it's about and, and, and those are the things that we need to focus on because either we're going to have like eco-socialism which is what we should want um, or eco-fascism and I think and like it's very possible to be pursuing like climate stuff and still be causing like oppression and harm to a lot of people um, and so it's really important for us not to just think that because someone like is behind the climate science that that means that they like have the best interests of the majority of people at heart because that's just definitely not the case um, and we write a bit about eco-fascism in the book but I think that for me like as a baseline like the future that I'm fighting for um, is is one in which like everyone and every single person on this earth is able to like have live in dignity um, to experience joy um, often um, and to not be like worrying about the things you need to survive like I think that's like a bare minimum like everyone should be housed and everyone should like have safe water it's, it's so wild when we think about this that this is like seen as like a radical that, that was kind of the premise of like the title it's like how is this any of this seen as like ridiculous like the fact that everyone should be able to live in dignity and have access to joy often but we live in, in a world where the, the majority of people on this earth do not live lives where that is all possible um, and so I think that like as a, as a baseline it's like yeah living in dignity, which I think encompasses a lot of these things. Um, but the reason why I include joy is because I think that we can make out that, like, in order for everyone to live in dignity, we have to live, like, really boring lives. Um, I just don't think that's true. And, like, even the studies that have, like, mapped these things out, and there's a study that I referred to in the book which has mapped out, what like, us living in a climate-safe future, what would that look like? And it's, like, um, I think people think we'd go and live in caves again or something, and instead it's, like, we'd have to go back to, like, consumption levels of the 1950s, and we'd um, still be able to use, like computers or air conditioning where you need air conditioning you'd be able to like be safe and happy and you'd have more time for yourself and less time at work and things that's the kind of future I'm fighting for and it's very 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 possible and that's what was a key thing that I really wanted to make clear um um but yeah I think like yeah a world obviously free from from oppression oppression but I think I think the dignity thing kind of like for me encompasses a lot of those bits but I hope that helped a bit but but I would add quickly. Um, <laughs> at the end of the book, I left like half a blank page. Please do actually turn over to the following page. It's not over. Um, for <laughs> no, for folks to like sit down and like, I want people to write down like, what is that future you want to like envision? And I even said like, rip, rip the page out. And then my editor wrote in like, if this is your copy, um, which I think was <laughs> <laughs> an important edit to be made. Um, but, and I was like, and stick it on the wall and like see it often. Like, I think that like know what you're fighting for and it could be really specific or it could be really like broad. Um, but yeah, we, I think knowing what, what you're looking towards is, is really, really helpful. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. I think we have time for a couple more. There's one over here. And is there another one? So I know where to go next. And then one at the back. Um, 
So once they've asked their question, if you want to come forward and start. Hi, can't wait to read the book. Um, I was wondering, how do we kind of bridge the gap or find a balance between making those individual choices, such as you know reducing plastic, not buying fast fashion, mm. but also the wider structural choices of actually dismantling capitalism and oppressive systems? Because I think people can have two extremes. You can either say, oh, yeah. well, you know, I only shop zero waste, therefore don't need to do anything else. Mm. Or people can say, oh, I can take as many flights as I want because it's mm. the billionaires polluting. So how do you suggest we kind of find the right balance of those two kind of areas? That's, that's a really, really good question, um, and thank you for it. Um, and that is something that I do dive into in here, but, um, but, but briefly here. Um, I think it's that realising, when I'm, when I'm saying that, like, I used to, like, spend all my time going and, like, trying to avoid plastic, whatever, um, and that that wasn't the best use of of my time it's more because that was all I did like all like for a while I was like oh that's all I can do and I think that the reality is is in the UK in particular um if even if we move the entire like energy grid over to renewables now um because we live under capitalism where we make a load of stuff that no one actually does, doesn't need but we need to make it in order to grow so that um capitalism can be sustained um we would still and because of the lifestyles that we live which are based upon this like kind of having a lot of stuff we don't need um we'd still have like too we'd have too much energy demand um and so there is going to be a necessary like change to lifestyles and the way we live our lives and the things that we have in our lives um so it's not to say that um it's not like a, i think that we often ask as if it's like a system change versus lifestyle change thing when actually it's like no no no. we need like we need both like we we do need to be making climate friendly behaviors we do need to be like in particular in the uk like eating less like animal products and we do need to be like moving away from behaviors that are like not compatible um with the the planet as it is now um but at the same time we the only way that those choice choices will be like accessible for the majority of people is if there's like big systemic change and so we need to be thinking like not just like sustainability for me or like I don't know, climate for me, it's like, how do we do it for we, like for the collective? Um, and how can we make it that if I can, if I can like, I don't know, if I could pay to insulate my home, which I definitely can't do, which, um, how can I make it that my neighbors can also do that? How can I make it that people in my community can also do that? And how we do that is by like big systemic change and making it so that there are like, there is either funding available for that or there are like, policies put through for that to be possible so it's like it's making a bit of both and I think that um yeah it's it's not to like ignore either side but to realize that like bits of both are important but the what's necessary is like big like we need to like overturn this entire system and, and transform things and so to do that requires a lot of different tactics in a similar way that like even like when we talk about the abolition of like slavery for example that was a movement which was built by like people, uh, people who were enslaved revolting against um, their oppressors um, by people like doing communications kind of things around that as well, like using newspapers in, in, in like in the kind of core of the empire in the UK. Um, and also by people doing boycotts of like not buying sugar, like that was a, a big part of that campaign as well. And so it, but all of those, all of those things together were necessary in order for like the change to happen. And so it's not to say that like, to one of them was, and we, but we're told obviously that it was just like, you know, one person went and said, hey, this isn't good anymore, and it all ended. That's not how it happened. It was, it was a lot of different tactics. And so in a similar way, we need to be using a lot of different tactics now um, and not like disregarding um, any of them, if that, if that was helpful. Hi, thank you so much for writing your book and also sharing the process of writing your book as you did, so I cannot wait to read it. Um, my question comes in kind of two parts and I'm quite happy for you to choose which part you deal with. Um, so like the first part is uh, from your experience um, in activism, uh, especially because the media tends to give activism this kind of crazy... Um, you know, we're the ones in the wrong type approach um, and uses that to alienate the majority that we really need on board in taking things forward. From your experience, like, what's the best things that we can do to appeal to, you know, the climate-concerned citizen that doesn't identify with activism? And do we, in that kind of climate communication space, 
have a responsibility, and this is touching on the kind of fear and hope and, and eco grief, um, knowing that as we talk about climate reality and how terrifying it is, like, do we have a responsibility to hold those that we then share that with, knowing that the paralysis that we've maybe felt that's brought us to this moment mm -hmm. is something that we're then putting upon them? Mm -hmm. I know they're both horrible questions, sorry. <laughs> pick whichever you like to respond to thank you <laughs> i i think um thank you for the questions thank you very much um i think on like how do we um maybe reach people who've been made to to believe that this like work is too radical or whatever or too ridiculous um i think that it's it's recognizing in certain conversations like where to use different types of language like this is something that I write about in the chapter on like too radical or not radical enough but um like maybe sometimes we could just say what we mean rather than using like jargon like maybe rather than saying like oh come and be an activist you could say like oh come and like um support your community I don't know like something that something that would resonate with them or maybe rather than like yeah saying like oh I don't know maybe don't maybe if they're not going to come to a protest but they would come to like a meeting and they would like contribute, I don't know, a couple hours and I, don't know, I always say this, the spreadsheets thing just because no one wants to be part of the spreadsheets making groups <laughs> but I feel like there are so many people out there who maybe wouldn't want to go and like glue themselves to a road but they'd be happy to help with some spreadsheets um, <laughs> and no one else wants to do it um, but there are, I think making it like uh, maybe visibilizing like how or like illuminating, I don't think visibilizing is a word um, <laughs> illuminating how many different roles there are in movement and, and, and how change really happens I think that's really helpful to people of like I think people believe that all climate activists are just the people who are like all, all activism is just like shouting on the streets and like holding a placard and the reality is that the majority of like I guess activist work or work in order to like build a better world um a lot of it is like fairly mundane and like writing google docs or like um making people cups of tea at meetings or like supporting people emotionally or like doing doing like a wide array of different things that will appeal to like all different types of people and so maybe like yeah maybe letting go of some of the jargon that maybe they were they were already like they will already respond to not in the best way saying what we really mean um and then reaching them of like oh maybe they're i don't know a, they like photography i don't that's a random thing but and maybe say oh would you like to come along to this thing and take some photos that'd be really helpful for us or would or maybe they're really great at writing maybe would you be willing to like edit this document that we've been working on and that is still act, that is that is activism and that is like important um but it might be like a more accessible like entry point for them um and i think that, that i just can't remember your second question so i hope that, that was all, all right is that one yeah. but that's what i would say but there's more in the book <laughs> I think that's all we had time that's for. It. We're out of time. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I feel like it was absolutely wonderful. I'm sure everyone else thinks it was absolutely wonderful. So a huge round of applause for you. <laughs> That's wonderful. Oh my god, oh my god, I'm gonna cry, I'm gonna cry. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. Thank you though, Brian. That's fun. Standing ovations aren't very usual at book events, so <laughs> this is pretty well, awesome. Th thank you, Bryce, for beginning that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, can I quickly just say thank yeah. you, everyone, like so much. This is like really kind of overwhelmed I don't know no I'm gonna cry again it's not no as you can tell I'm a very emotional person um but it is beyond like I I the writing this was like one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life because it, I doubted myself so often whilst doing it um and it just means the absolute like world to have people here like physically who like care enough to have shown up on a Thursday evening um to hear me ramble away um <laughs> But um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you all so much for being here. And and please, please do, if you have time, stick around and chat to the groups here. Um, I was a part of both Edinburgh Anti-Raid, Stock Cambo, and um, 
Climate Camp Scotland, um, and they are all brilliant groups. There are also other groups here that are equally as brilliant. I just did not obviously have the time to be involved. Um, so please do um, go along and, and chat to them. And please, this is a, this is not a book about just like having good politics and being a better person. It's about like good politics compels us to act and do something. Um, good politics, but like I mean, changing how we think about things or transforming ourselves compels us to co transform the world around us. So please do be part of that. And thank you so much. Sorry that I spoke again. Wish I was meant to. Yeah. Go. You can get your book signed. So we're going to take yes. uh, Michaela to the signing table, which is over there. So join us there. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.